Recording. 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 Yep. I saw my timeline shift. <gasps> the time shift. That's a Michael Crichton novel. Is it? Right? Are we getting into a, a time slip? Are we going to have to do a, the time warp again? Did we watch that movie yet? No, we haven't. Ah, Roxy, Rocky Horror. I've, I've seen it so many times. I don't know if I'd want to want. I don't know if I'd want to do a review of it. I think Rocky Horror warrants talking about. There's a lot of wacky shit to talk about. There's a lot to unpack in that movie. <laughs> as many things to unpack in that movie as there are guts to unpack from this kid in the desert. Oh. That's a stretch. I'm Joe. I'm Ken. I'm Andrew. And I'm Dan. And we're the Rewinders Podcast, rewinding movies to see if they hold up. And this time, we flew our helicopter over the desert, kicking up stones and sands in all them nerdy scientist faces to give them more money by watching Jurassic Park. Do you think they'd prefer nerds in their stony faces? Yeah, considering <laughs> that part one only got like... 10% of the movie done. We are in trouble, gentlemen. <laughs> we can do this. We've already covered most of the movie, so this is the second part's going to go by nice and fast. Or maybe we can uh, Peter Jackson this? We've covered 10 minutes of the movie so far. Less than 10% of the actual movie. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! Hey, oh. So, if I remember correctly, we were taught, uh, we stopped at the scene where... Uh, we get introduced to Grant and Hammond and Ellie. Yeah, kind of. And in there, Grant, like, totally chews out a kid. This kid is not credited with a name. What? He doesn't he deserve a name. He is literally just volunteer boy. Oh, okay. If you name him, you get closer to him. You don't want to give him a name if you're not going to keep him. That's why it's easy to just remember the annoying kid. But see, the internet has decided that the volunteer boy... Is Chris Pratt's character? Yeah, I saw that. There's there's a theory that Chris Pratt is the kid grown up. Yeah, and I don't know how to feel about that. And that's why he's working at turkeys. So does he mind meld with the Velociraptors after getting the threat of being killed by a Velociraptor? Is that what's going I on? I don't know. But the the actor has come out and said that that's absolutely not true because it's his character, damn it. Yeah, or something along those lines. <laughs> it's mine. Mine. I am, I am not Chris Pratt. It came to me. I am not Owen Grady. Oh, okay. So that, wow. Okay. I didn't realize people would want to go that far into their fanfics. Uh, there is a corner of the internet that that would be. I mean, be. it would fit really well with how the Jurassic Park series very rarely has a Chekhov's gun. Okay. So, like, they introduced this character, and he really is only just to, just to show that Grant really hates kids. But he would fit in to being, like, what Grant said to him is what triggered his want to, like, learn more about velociraptors and become Chris Pratt's character, Owen Grady. It's a really, it's a really deep internet lore rumor thing that I can kind of feel fits in, but at the same time, maybe we just leave the kid alone. You know, had they actually pulled, pointed that out in the movie... They're like, oh, Dr. Grant yelled at me, and now I don't, now I'm uh, making love to dinosaurs. Then the internet would come down and be like, not everything has to be connected. That's so dumb. Like, so fine, make up your own stories. <laughs> I guess leave it, leave it vague on purpose because, again, it doesn't need to be explained. And uh, we could still, it could still come out in the new, the new movie. Nope. Like, that, impossible. That, that is, there is a chance that it could be brought up. Because we got Grant, we got Grant's character, and we have the Owen Grady character. They're all coming back in the same time and place as each other. Because they went into the Nexus. What's a Nexus? A storytelling element that was really bad in the Star Trek universe. Ah, okay, one of those things. I believe that's what it was called. <laughs> <laughs> I, I haven't seen any Star Wars or Star Trek. I should say I've seen all the Star Wars. That's fine, most of it. Uh, so I, I will say, on a serious note, this movie showed some great restraint by not having the child pee his pants. I feel like this <laughs> these days the, the the kid would probably ended with wet drawers. Yeah, yeah. I expected that in later parts of the movie, but instead of having peed or pooped pants, it was pukies. 
Which is... And that's just fine. Also I good did. restraint. It's okay. Little Timmy Tim's got some serious plot armor. I think we'll get... We'll, we'll, we'll talk, talk to about it that. when we get to that part of the movie. It's coming up, I bet. <laughs> Sometime soon. Hopefully we don't skip over that part. It'd be very difficult, but... I guess we could skip into a uh, into a trailer. So before yeah. we get into the trailer, can we talk about how fast for an old man Hammond is? <laughs> because that helicopter lands, yeah. and Grant and Ellie are like panicking about getting the 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 dig site covered and all yeah. that. And Grant gets to the helicopter, and the helicopter pilot is like down in the trailer. And, like, no time passes. They didn't waste your time showing how long it takes to cover up an entire dig site. It takes a while for them to, 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 to I'm guessing, to cover up that entire dig site. And then they're going to go look for the jerk who does that. I'm willing to accept it as an editing mistake. He did the jump roll. And that's how he got there so fast. <laughs> he just jump rolled the whole way. For an old man. He's got mods installed. <laughs> yeah, he does. <laughs> He's a hacker. <laughs> He prefers to be called. Please. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how I felt about him when I first see him, though. I mean, when I was younger, he doesn't give an aura of being a rich dude. He he has the like island life look, but not rich. Yeah, his his affluency is like low. He he feels like a like a gentleman that I'd meet in Florida. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But also, I think his uh, they portray his uh, affluency as entitlement, so he feels entitled to go in and rifle through all their stuff, and so you you understand that there's something a bit odd about him. I mean, if they would have kept him to his book counterpart, he'd he'd be a hell of a lot more menacing. And was this scene the first first bit of uh, spared no expense? Um, I don't think that line is said but i mean hammond does throw his checkbook around i do have it written down spared no expense also he doesn't care for lawyers it's uh interesting that he doesn't why do you think he doesn't tell him that there's dinosaurs at this park to keep him bait and hooked he wants their genuine shock as they look out and see the dinosaurs that could be so yeah then we get the taste of his uh negotiating skills where he's uh slowly stepping up the uh hey come on out Hey, come on out. I can tell you there's dinosaurs, but nope. A little bit of foreshadowing. Probably wouldn't believe me anyway. No, I wouldn't. No, why would you? That's I mean, that's some, definitely something you don't believe until you see. The one thing I don't believe is that this is the first time anyone on a dig site is dirty. And it's not from digging. From the helicopter. It's from the helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> sure, that's a fair sure. point i actually didn't put that apart uh put that together because yeah when he's looking at the screen they're not all that dirty and then when they come in they're just like head to toe that helicopter was real real rough well, the fact that the pilot didn't like you know turn the rotors off after he or at least put the rotors on you know not lift <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> he waits until they start heading towards the trailer and then he starts turning down the engine so Grant and Ellie cause more problems for their dig site by distracting the pilot. They really do, if you think about it. Like, that helicopter's landed. You guys should really cover up your shit so it doesn't get ruined. And then you ask, you, you, you try to you try to force the chopper pilot to, you know, do stuff. That's uh, a show of force by John Hammond as well. Because you would think he knows that they're on a dig site. And he he understands. He's got a dinosaur park, so he knows people love them dino bones. Yet he chooses to go out there in a helicopter that he's got to know is going to cause problems. Because they operate on a $50,000 a year budget. He's a jerk. <laughs> he is also, you know, on a time crunch. He could have sent them letters if he if he didn't want to mess up the thing. But he, he needed them there then. And he goes out and tells them that we need... The lawyer, my lawyer tells me we need to have some specialists come out, and you're as special as they come. Why don't you come on out? Actually, the lawyer, the insurance company want, named them. He could have taken a limo out there. A limo? <laughs> Across the Badlands? A Hummer limo. Of- a Hummer limo? <laughs> How? What's the flight radius of a helicopter? It's a bigger helicopter, though. Because um, like, he's coming from... Laden or unladen? The- 
I guess. <laughs> are we... is, it, is it an African <laughs> helicopter <laughs> or European? Uh, I would think it'd be. I think it'd be European. Uh, it comes from you know Isla Sorna, which is down there by what, Puerto Rico. Where is that by? No, he's not flying the helicopter directly. Yeah, no. He he said he says later on, I've got a jet standing by the chateau. They would take the helicopter from the jet to the dig site, and then the helicopter from the dig site to the jet. Okay, but then. It doesn't make sense because they take a helicopter anyways to the island. But. Yeah, there's a lot of helicopters and not jets. Yeah, probably more of Hammond's uh, showman's, <laughs> showmanship. Depend where, like, because it, it's, obviously it's an InGen helicopter. Does InGen have a fleet of their own transport? Well, he spared no expense, so I'm guessing he purchased the helicopters. So obviously InGen probably has multiple helicopters. You wonder how they're going to bus people in when it actually opens By the boat. park. It's the boat system that they use to get off the island. All right, all right. So this is a high priority. Let's get them to the island right now and yeah. helicopter. This is VIP treatment. Got it. We're going to shake you up before we put you down. You talk about how absolutely awful that landing pad is. Why would you put a helipad in all of all of the places that you could on that island, why why at the bottom of a waterfall? Because it's gorgeous. Wind shear. I think it just keeps laying into the fact that that Hammond wasn't thinking logistics. He was only going for showmanship. Correct. He does yeah. it so many times throughout the, throughout the movie. Like it's that it's the plants that he chose just because they look nice instead of actually doing research on them. Things like that. There's so many things that he's just kind of bumbling and aloof about because he cares more about making an impression. Like, just making people awestruck. Generally speaking, the spared no expense, I can't actually, I didn't pay attention. But that was all things being presented to the customer at that I point. I really should have kept track of how many times he says that line. The Jeeps, the ice cream, the whatever. <laughs> like, these are all things that are, like, being showy. Being like, this is really cool, check it out. I spared no expense. And so, yeah, that's all that. And then on the back end, you got him actually being the shrewd negotiator, the no nedger who can't give you more money to do your job. You pay your own job. And then again, he does put in concrete moats, apparently, for his dinosaurs and motion sensors. Such because, yeah. All the stuff in the book that didn't make it into the movie, sadly. Yeah, it was something I read that the, the original, like, paddock designs were more fortified you can't expect that more fortified a little bit more open as well so you can actually see things we're getting ahead of ourselves <laughs> we have yet to go to the ned first nedry scene with oh we skipped Dogma right over or we could dog cog what? Yeah, you forgot about Dog Cog or Dodgson. Dogma or Dodgson. 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 That Dodgson. we didn't skip over it. We're there right now. Oh, Lewis Dodson. That's yes. the next scene. A goddamn Wayne Knight playing good, hateable characters. This is such an introduction. That's the big thing about this scene right here. Just nailing home how perfect this movie got casting. Yes, it really did. <laughs> Wayne Knight in this one. Hammond, although was in the previous scene. I think Wayne Knight really nails that home even better. But, like, Hammond's perfect, Grant's perfect, Ellie is amazing. They're just all amazing in this movie and really good. And I couldn't, I never really tried, but I couldn't imagine there being somebody else in this movie. Imagine a Nick Cage instead of a Goldblum. Oh, for sure, yeah. And it, it really goes to show, like, Spielberg wanted to have a majority of the cast be made up of unknowns. He didn't want it to be like this A-list studded, multi multiple A-listers just kind of like being on a marquee for the movie. He wanted to have to actually have relatable people that were great character actors. So that's all the people that he brought in, newcomers, people he hadn't seen before, well-known names that had just been doing things you know on the back end that hadn't been really in Starlight. So like, it makes their characters feel more grounded and more realistic versus going in for the like, let's say if it was like Bruce Willis playing dr alan grant and things like that like oh, god it just it, it just it right. makes me grip my teeth thinking about it oh yeah it's one of those things where like oh we need a name to sell our movie well yeah we got spielberg and that's and we got these fucking dinosaurs. dinosaurs like <laughs> you don't necessarily need big names to sell this movie at that point let's put in some exactly. people who are going to really fill this rules out perfectly which some of the people who accepted not, accepted roles in the movie pretty much said just that when they got got the call from their agents or whatever and they said dinosaurs it's steven spielberg it's like yeah i don't need to hear anything else <laughs> <laughs> but yeah you get some of the coolest technology ever with the barbell saw can would not hold up with today's uh airport security no, it would not. those scanners would see right through that yep no, he was going to take a boat though true he didn't but need to go through airport to say security. that a major like port that handles people 
doesn't have the same technology. Uh, spoilers, they do. <laughs> <laughs> I've been on a boat, aka cruise line. Yeah, they they have a uh, they have scanners and they go through your luggage. Well, they don't necessarily go through your luggage, but like. Like an airport. Yeah. Except for they didn't have the full body scan thing, so maybe he could put it in a pocket or something, but even then, ugh. In his bush. <laughs> Grody. <laughs> I take high offense on how he treated those desserts as well in this scene. Oh, Wasted. absolutely. As a child, I thought it was whipped cream. I was like, why'd they put whipped cream inside his uh, shaving cream can? No, it's it's just, a, just another part of the thing to show that he's a... Awful, awful, awful person. And wasteful and not, doesn't think ahead. And it's a really good build of character for this particular character. And he has a calculator watch. They also took time to develop Dotson. And this is the only time he's in the movie. And he's goofy. He's like dressed up like a CIA guy there to do some sort of shady deal, which he is. And, well, I mean, this is obviously Costa Rica. I'm assuming supposed to be the mainland, not on the island. And, you know, what do the locals care if some guy shows up and hands off a bag to some other guy that, who cares who they Iconic are? Iconic line number two. See? Nobody cares. Nice hat. <laughs> uh, I would have went with Dotson. We got a Dotson here. Oh, it's all tied together. <laughs> That's just my, my last note for this scene. So many iconic lines in this movie. Just lovely. I don't know, the, uh, don't go getting cheap on me, Dotson. It definitely sets him up as, uh... Being of ill repute. Going for what he's worth at this point, I guess. Being of ill repute, yeah. Like, it's a, it's a interesting character choice to make you like, okay, yeah, that just, he's gonna get on my nerves a little bit. And then we get to the helicopter, going to the island and having the turbulence. Yep. And introduced to Malcolm. Probably one of my favorite characters between the book and the movie. And Goblu does a really good job portraying him. Like an uh, absolutely stellar. Absolutely. And I'm glad that he got to stick around. And the fact that they were thinking about even cutting his character and, and shifting some of the what? lines over. Originally, yeah, because yeah, originally, originally the... like, the Malcolm character was, like, Frighten's mouthpiece for the movie. And yeah. a lot of his, like, lines in the book are just tactless. Yeah. And they wanted to flush out Grant a little bit more. So, like, the first draft or so of the screenplay they had... Most of Malcolm's lines kind of merging with Alan's character. But the fact that they let him come back in is so freaking good because it's... I can't picture any of these iconic characters not being in this film. And then even to that point, uh, Malcolm's scene was actually supposed to end with the T-Rex uh, paddock attack. He's supposed to die there. But Ian actually talked to Steven Spielberg, or Jeff Goldblum talked to Steven Spielberg and suggested that he had more of like a heroic... He spends the rest of the movie without a shirt? Yeah, right? <laughs> No, that, that Malcolm got to have like a more heroic piece in the film where he actually tries to protect the kids. So that's that's kind of where that came about. So thanks to Jeff Goldblum, we got more Ian Malcolm. So thank you. It makes me yeah. excited to see what he's going to do with Mr. Malcolm in the new movie. Hopefully more than just uh, 15 seconds to give a quote and then the rest of the movie yeah. can't be carried off that quote. <laughs> it looks like it's going to be great. I'm, I'm honestly excited. I'm not going to lie. The last They're one just going to say, oh, there he is. And he'll be laying on a table without his shirt on going, huh. <laughs> 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 and Alan Grant laying on his stomach, chest. <laughs> yup, yup. I... <laughs> going up and down. Oh my God, I love that gif. That's one of my absolute favorites. <laughs> <laughs> you say he's tactless in the book. He's he's pretty tactless in this in this movie as well. He says a lot of things that are just, oh my, did he just say not, that? Not Type Three of scenes from here, I have a note just about that. <laughs> right. And also, this movie would be not nearly as good without this character to be the, at least, Kickstarter of the ethical debate. Yeah. Like, I, I'm glad they kept that separate from Grant and Ellie. Like, they, they needed a separate person there who was there specifically just to think about what could go wrong. And you get Malcolm for that, and that's perfect. We also get the "I bring scientists, you bring you bring a rock star" line. Yep. Iconic yep. line number three. <laughs> oh my god, I, I could sit here and talk for hours about the lines in this movie because I, they're so ingrained in my my personality, so ingrained in my mind. It's just the the writing turned out so well. But yeah, I, I can't honestly imagine a world without Doctor Ian Malcolm, and I feel sad even thinking about a possibility of that. So. I'm very, 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 very glad that he stayed in the movie and that his character was flushed out some more. And also in this scene, I like that you get the very first glimpse that maybe some expenses were spared by 
Grant not having a proper seatbelt. Oh, come on. I've done that, but I wasn't as clumsy as he was with it. It's very funny that you just tied them together like, ha see, I can do this. But also like he didn't have the proper seatbelts. The, er, the helicopters were not necessarily properly fashioned. Well, I don't, I don't think that was Or it. chucked over. I, think, I don't think he went to go look for the other end. I think he just went to go clip them together, realized, I'm not going to dig for this, I don't know where it is, and just tied it together. You're telling me somebody who digs for a living wouldn't <laughs> dig for a seatbelt? That's a good <laughs> point. That's a good point. But, but hey, we also get foreshadowing piece as well. Two female ends of belt, seatbelt buckles being tied together, representing that life will find a way. Holy shit. Representing that two female species will come together and somehow form life so really really cool piece on dr grant's lap (laughs) and also it's just a really funny scene it's just yeah if you think about it too much you can find (laughs) meaning in it that maybe wasn't supposed to be there but (laughs) wow well that and he's not gonna be made to look too much like a fool in front of this very i don't want to call him an alpha male but malcolm who is this (laughs) man interest who is suddenly also just coming on to ellie right away too so he doesn't want to look like a adult yeah no very very true and i'm trying to judge if this landing pad is real or not because they actually land on it they made it for the film they actually destroyed it after the film okay that's what i figured i'm like they land on it so it's got to be real enough is the jurassic park gate still out there no that blew down in the uh, hurricane so that's gone too. The only thing left are a couple of poles that indicate where the sides were. So wait, the hurricane wasn't actually part of the movie, just something that happened during the movie, and they're like, oh, let's use it. Yeah, no, Stephen actually, <laughs> Stephen actually convinced, uh, I can't remember who it was, but they basically went out in the hurricane to film some shots to use in the movie. So like the are scene where the, me? I, the scene where the waves are crashing on the on the breakwater and things like that, that's actually really happening. And Steven just saw opportunity. He's like, well, there's supposed to be a storm coming in the movie. Why not? That's amazing. Uh-huh. <laughs> that makes sense because the film quality of those shots is different from the other ones. Yes. So they obviously were using different gear to do the uh, B shots or whatever. Yep. <laughs> awesome yeah i mean it's a beautiful little alcove with that huge waterfall though you cannot beat that location yeah it's still one of the biggest tourist spots for people going to see locations in hawaii that were filmed so my old manager went to that area they didn't do it on purpose but they went there and they're like oh they filmed Jurassic park here they still left dinosaur bones here hey look what's this barbersaw can do in here yeah and then from there they get in those uh jeeps oh Yes, and then they're driving around, and one of the iconic most scenes. iconic scenes yep. from this movie. I don't recall where Ellie got that plant from. She just grab it. She, she must have just grabbed it as they were driving through. It's a deleted scene. She actually reaches out and grabs it as the as the jeep is going down the path. Okay, and then she's like, "Oh, this shouldn't exist. This went extinct year, uh, however many years ago." And as she's so ingrained on that, she misses the giant elephant in the room which is bigger than an elephant and not in a room (laughs) the very first dinosaur you see in this movie now i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna blaspheme a little bit here i know that a lot of the visual effects in this movie are fantastic and stand up to the the test of time however the computer generated effects are aged and i feel like if somebody were to come in and just modernize all of the CG visual effects and left all the practical effects as they were, this movie could keep going for hundreds of hundreds of years. I disagree. The only scene that bothers me and really bummed me out when I got the Blu-ray, because up until having Blu-ray and having that clarity, it wasn't noticeable, was the Brachiosaurus. The Brachiosaurus is not aging well, but then again, it's out in the open daylight. So that's kind of the biggest problem with that. Steven really, really, really hung on using the darkness to his advantage in this movie with special effects. Like a horror movie. Yeah, and that really shows with the T-Rex attack. It really shows everything else. And honestly, it really shows with the T-Rex attack and the Gallimimus at, at, at that point too. Like, that's a great shot fantastic shot but i mean i'm gonna keep calling out scenes that could use that could use some cleanup yeah and i'm, in, I'm interested to hear that I, I just i know the the brachiosaurus for sure definitely stuck out to me are you talking about this very first brachiosaurus yes yeah the texture on the skin for this yeah, one yeah. sadly it 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 like floats on the ground like just yeah. above the ground it doesn't look like it's walking along the ground it was an awe-inspiring shocking scene when you saw it for the first time and for like 10 15 years afterwards but yeah with modern technology and with modern movie filmmaking it's it's showing the roughness around the edges 
still impactful, but it's it's still it's... jabs a needle into that nostalgia vein, though. Yes, yes. it does. Yes. Well, even that whole like the whole watering hole in the same scene, like I give that, I that like it'd be cool for them to clean that up, but I that VFX can totally be like given a pass because the dinosaurs are at such a distance that they're going to be fuzzy in your camera if you were filming actual dinosaurs drinking out of a watering hole. See, that's still one of my favorite scenes in the movie too, because the rest of the movie feels very artificial. It feels manufactured because that's how it's supposed to feel. You're going from exhibit to exhibit. So you have a cage with a thing in it, like a zoo. Whereas that's like the one shot in the whole film where it's a dinosaur ecosystem doing stuff that you've only seen illustrated in books or you know hypothesized about. So watching all the dinosaurs go down to the watering hole from different herds, drinking and, you know, sloshing through, that was such a cool shot. Yeah. I love that shot. You also have... Alan saying the same thing that everyone else is here oh, is saying. Like he's mm-hmm. saying that out loud. They do move in packs. Oh my! Yeah, this isn't a cold blood animal. This thing's <laughs> yeah. a warm blooded animal. Like things that you just theorize as a job. Like all of a sudden you can just know. You just look at it and just know. Yeah, you just know that it's they're smarter and and more powerful and more of a creature than you thought that they were. <laughs> like they're not just bumbling. That's monsters. wild. Yeah. You've, you've got you, even Ellie's line of this thing doesn't live in a swamp when she's like looking at the, <laughs> at the brachiosaur in astonishment. It, it, it is everything that you're feeling as a viewer to the movie being said in that scene, like you said. It's great. Yeah. I would worry if we would update these CG dinosaurs because I feel today's CG has its own faults as well that are maybe... I wouldn't want to push it like super make modern. It worse. I would just... Just to clean it up to make it fit more into the scene that it's in. And we have the tech to be able to do that easily. Just from all of the quarter of digital videos that I watch. And they even, like, they broke down a bunch of the digital VFX in this movie. Maybe if it was, uh, I don't know if we got people who actually know how to constrain themselves to just touch it up a little bit versus... Anyone gets their hands on this movie, like, oh, yeah, we're going to add some do-backs in the background here. They, they're, they're not going to know where to stop. They're gonna be, there's going to be slime on everything. <laughs> Saliva between the teeth. Why? I don't know. It doesn't matter. We just we want it. It's cool. Yep, yep. I guess it would, I, I, I see your guys' worry about people just going off the deep end with it, but I feel like this movie is such a masterpiece. I mean, if I was to be a, v, a VFX artist, I wouldn't want to fuck it up yeah but we also have people like you know george lucas who decides that we have to add entire fucking terrible cg scenes and ruining movies yeah you don't want to be the uh, art historian destroying a old christian relic because you don't know how to properly restore a painting (laughs) turn it into pop art whoops you know you have to delete you have to destroy the originals in order to be able to do (laughs) updates Uh, it hurts i'm sorry how do you guys feel about the the main building, the central building that comes at after that scene? I love that entire set. It is there is so much that they put into that entire visitor center and the control compound. Yeah. There's just it's so cool. There's so much going on in there and all of the like side characters that are literally there just to fill screen space, but they all have something to do like painting walls and opening doors <laughs> I, I don't know i think the design is so ridiculously iconic that it stands up and it inspires it fills you with that sense of what it's all about it's got that adventure feel to it and everything else i love the freaking architecture in this movie and again that's thanks to the wonderful design team that they had for this everything's got so much life breathed into it and i feel like that's kind of where the new movies kind of fail a little bit not getting too crazy with those but <laughs> I mean, yeah, the Visitor Center or the Imagination or Innova- Innovation Center, whatever the hell it's called in the new movies, it, it looks great. It's it's a cool design, but it's, it's lacking just every single piece dripping with creativity throughout this film. You have the Jeeps, you know, there's there's reasoning behind the Jeeps the way they look. In the book, it was described because the, the Triceratops uh, were attacking the feeders, so or not attacking the feeders, but attacking the Jeeps. So they actually painted the diagonal red stripes on because they found that it re- the red specifically repelled uh, Triceratops. They didn't like that. So that's why they have the red stripes on them. It's, it's for a purpose, not just for funsies. And just the crazy design on the Ford Explorers, the, the Night Vision goggles and everything else coming up. This movie is just dripping 
absolutely dripping with character. And I feel like the new movies are just kind of more militarial, I guess. Just blues, concrete, squares. Yeah, you got some cool things like the gyrosphere and things like that, but I, I don't know. It's true. This movie is not obsessed with the teal and orange look that most movies that are more modern can't break away from. Yeah. This thing's bright and colorful, just like a theme park should be. Now, to be fair, we've already touched on it. This movie is operating under the assumption that the person who is dis- is building it is building it because he's a showman. Mm-hmm. Now, that doesn't cover the uh, Jeeps being what they are, but everything else, the visitor center being so well detailed, fits perfectly the persona of somebody trying to bring this to people he he wants his big flea circus yeah. however the new movies don't have the john hammond feel they have the manufactured feel the they don't have that create that creation behind it taking it packaging it up and slapping it on the lunchbox yeah they don't have that creation behind it they don't have the people that passionate about that they have people who want money behind it and so they're like let's make this look cool instead of let's make this beautiful which you could also say about the people making the movie, but that's me making a lot of assumptions and being kind of mean. <laughs> well, I mean, there's there's a lot that does play into that. Like, the logo itself was actually developed by Universal Studios. Uh, I can't remember specifically the team that did it, but essentially they, they gave, you know, the same guy, John Bell and everybody else who worked on the design team, they gave them shots to design everything in terms of the vehicles, the settings, the control room, the visitor center, all that stuff. And yeah, they had their own designs for what the logo should look like and what they thought it would look like. But ultimately, there are pieces, considering this is supposed to be a marketable thing, that they had to actually take back to like the Universal team and be like, design us what the logo would look like if you were trying to actually make it mass marketable at a theme park and slapping it on anything you can. And they came back with the logo that they did. <laughs> It's there's a and lot. To honestly, that. it's clever. It is clever. That's it's a great. clever way of doing that. Yeah, it, there's a lot of thinking about that that has to be done because at this time the only real parallel was Disney. There wasn't Universal Studios, the you know theme park to go to or anything like that, and that's where Stephen was getting his inspiration from, is making it feel like this bright and colorful Disney World or Disneyland, yeah, <laughs> dinosaur park. So. There's a lot of it goes, that goes into that where it kind of bridges that third wall and you have to actually think marketing-wise, like, how would you market this in real life? It's just awesome. I absolutely love all the little details. But yeah, that visitor center still looks sweet. I like how it has a safari feel. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Even though I, it's, like, definitely a lot of concrete and definitely kind of a fortress, too. Yeah. Which is interesting. I mean, that's the vibe it gives me a little bit. <laughs> A safari fortress. We do get a little bit more foreshadowing from Malcolm in this scene. We do. Grant and Ellie becoming extinct, but I feel like it's more foreshadowing for the entire series now that we're, you know, multiple movies in. Well, it's also a direct nod to Phil Tippett because they had hired him for the stop motion animation, which is how they planned on doing this. And when that video broke because they weren't planning on doing anything really cg except for a few small things motion blurs and whatnot but when the team went rogue <laughs> at uh ilm and and showed off the t-rex walking that was one of the direct quotes that somebody said i think it was steven it could have been anybody but somebody said said something along the same lines and, and steven liked it so much so it wasn't steven he liked it so much that he took it and put it in the movie as this line because uh, phil tippett famously he was he was amazing he was doing great work and then that happened and he took like a sabbatical for how many ever weeks or months it was and just disappeared because that's got to hit really hard knowing that that you're being you're being phased out by technology exactly like i can't even imagine feeling that way he's the king of stop motion animation coming in for this massive multi-million dollar project and to have that right in the beginning it's got to be such a gut punch but did you guys catch the doors too like they have the egg egg and like sunshine rays coming off of the egg kind of like a Yep. Uh, emotive. Yeah, they have that on the doors. They have that on their ID badges and things like that. There's not a single tiny detail in this movie that was missed. And it just goes to show with all that cool stuff that they throw in. Something, something, very little of Chekhov's gun. Something, something, something. How many times are you going to say this during these episodes? <laughs> I'm going to every time it is it is topical. Are we still in the first act? Because that's when you introduce Chekhov's gun. Um, yeah. Yep, we're still in the I'm, first act. I'm at 24 minutes right now. <laughs> 
<laughs> We've almost made an entire podcast out of the next 10 minutes. <laughs> 24 minutes into the movie, and we're, uh, we're over an hour and a half long. <laughs> oh, boy. Okay. Also, my notes go a little bit uh, sparse here. I, I was doing a next, 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 and now I don't exactly remember what's happening scene by scene. At this point, we get introduced to the park. Yeah, the ride aspect. In, yeah, and the ride aspect of it, because we get introduced to Mr. DNA. And I love how that video fits into the movie itself. How so? Well, because, like, Grant and Ellie and Malcolm are watching this movie, and we as the viewers of the movie are watching this little video and getting information that Grant and Ellie wanted answers to. Exactly. And they did that for a reason. The, the, the team behind the film was trying to ponder how do we let the audience know like how these dinosaurs were brought back to life, and it literally just came down to... Well, shit, let's just make a character called Mr. DNA and have him explain it. <laughs> so, here we go. Mr. DNA coming in for the rescue. It's a genius little way of doing it. Though You want to have, uh, <laughs> you want to educate your people on how things are done around here? Oh, here's how we did it. Yeah, it doesn't feel tacky. Like, there's so many ways this could have gone wrong, but in this film and in this universe and in what it's trying to do, there's so many things that just work that shouldn't normally work in a movie. Like, having such a deadpan thing tell you literally something just just laying it out just yep, explaining literally it to you. spoon feeding you yeah and you don't yeah. you don't feel you don't get off put by having something sp- spoon fed to you because more normally Ooh. when a movie spoon feeds you information there is mm-hmm. there's something like i i feel stupid for being told this i was gonna say a great example of the complete opposite ends of the spectrum here dune versus this yeah <laughs> yup oh, where dune's giving man. you that whole like five ten minute exposition in the beginning like this is everything and blah 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 the universe and the history of everything it's like what the fuck whereas jurassic park it just feels natural like oh yeah that makes sense of course they'd have that for the tourists coming in <laughs> you know what does feel tacky about it though lap bars why the hell are there lap bars on this it ride? It is a moving ride. trolley. It's not moving that fast. No, it's supposed to be like the world of tomorrow at Disneyland. Like, just going in a circle, showing you all the bits and pieces. Does that... I haven't been to Disney. Does that have lap bars? No. <laughs> but this does. For safety's sake, Ken. They just got a lawsuit for a guy dying from a velociraptor attack. You think that they want a lawsuit for anything that could go wrong with this ride? <laughs> and obviously, they're not good lap bars. Three people push them off. Yeah. Right, three full-grown adults. Yeah. That's a lot of force right there, kind of. But that's not even the full row. Yeah. <laughs> the, the rows are like, what, they're like eight people? Yeah. Oh. Clearly, they want everyone to stay in their seat. They know that kids are going to go press their face up against the glass, and they don't want to pay uh, glass cleaners, <laughs> so they, they're like, yeah, sit down, all right, and I'll slap you in, and don't you dare move. Yep. Gennaro makes a, a real good point. Can people just, you know, lift the lap bar up? Because if they can... They can't do that. Can, can, can they, they do, do that? that? Yeah. They can't do that. And that just kind of goes, again, that's just <laughs> another one of those cost-saving measures that's in the film. You got the cost-saving measures of things constantly going wrong like that, like the lap bars, the the locks not being on the tour vehicles themselves. But then again, it also continuously drives that narrative of life finds a way. Life breaks through barriers. That's constantly happening in this movie and constantly reminding you that it's a thing. It beats you over the head with it. You don't even know it. Exactly. They were restrained. They were told they could not move, but they found a way to get up and go take care and look at the thing that they wanted to. That's going to keep happening. All right. We're going to put a pin in that uh, locks on the car thing for a future talk. (laughs) Absolutely. But don't worry, because life will find a way in two weeks when we come back for part two. Three. It's never ending. And we pick <laughs> we pick up around the twenty eight minute mark of the movie. <laughs> Guys, we are doomed. If you haven't watched we the movie yet, you still have a chance to watch it. This is a two hour movie. <laughs> Why did we decide to do this? We might need to break up this episode with episodes. Right? Right? <laughs> Let's step on the gas a little bit for the next episode and pick up the pace. Oh, yes. We'll hop in some vehicles and electrically cruise around the park at their pace in the next episode. So come back in two weeks when we rewind again. (laughs) Okay. Oh, right. We got to stop.